Hey, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with Kate. Hey, Kate, great to see you. Hi, really great to be with you. So folks that don't know who you are, where you are, what you do, why don't you give us the, the background? All right, my name is Kate Carruthers. I'm the Chief Data and Insights Officer at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, and I'm also an adjunct senior lecturer in computer science and engineering there. Uh, and I recently joined the Microsoft Regional Director Program, which is really fascinating. Yeah, congratulations. And thank you. Yeah, it's, re it's a really great community. I had no idea it even existed, like, like as early as last year. Yeah, it's now, a most really well kept secret. It, it, it is. It's, uh, well, it's, it's and, and that's, in, I guess, partly intentional. I mean, as you know, you've, you've seen some of the discussion where we're trying to kind of elevate the profile of the RDs, but it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a Microsoft being selfish, want to take really smart people and, and then pick their brains for Microsoft internal purposes. But, you know, and we're doing that, of course, but there's, uh, I think there's a lot of other, uh, it, it's a community that's not been fully tapped into by, you know, out, outside community. So I'm, I'm happy to see that Microsoft is doing more promotion of the, uh, of the group so there's i think i think there's more than 200 now i i'm not sure what the current count is um i just got renewed so this is my second two-year stint through oh congratulations and when i joined thank you when i joined there were 177 and i think there's like 220 now i'm not sure uh, oh, and, the, and there were no women rds in australia so uh we've got i think three or four now which yep. is really good Doing a yep. bit. It's been a great expansion. I've seen, yeah, I've got a couple of good friends that uh, just joined as well. So it's, it's great to see. Uh, and, and, and we're all experts in multiple areas. So, so you talked a little bit about your expert, well, your current roles now, what are kind of your, the, the, the diverse backgrounds, what are your areas of focus? So my focus areas are data and cybersecurity. Uh, data, because that's my job. I'm responsible for all the data across the university ma and managing it as an asset, making sure it's safe. So data security is actually in my job description. So, so cybersecurity is, is on my mind a lot. Uh, so I've um, done, done some studies. I'm doing some postgraduate studies in cybersecurity to get my head in the space. But uh, I've realized that that is the fundamental thing. If you're going to do stuff with data, especially in the cloud, you've got to, you've got to know your security. Well, there's a, you know, yeah, I think it's funny. My, so my part of my background is in data warehousing. So I worked for the phone company in California for a number of years and kind of found my way into knowledge management and collaboration technology, uh, uh, focused on project portfolio management with all of those systems all those enterprise applications have in common is that they generate massive amounts of data. And most people are oblivious to, they'd say, hey, I really wanna see this data on our two and a half million users in this region, and, but I'd really like to see it in, with the geographic information. I'd like to have demographic and psychographic information, so deeper profiles about purchasing patterns, kind of all those things. Can you just go pull that for me? Can you pull like, build a report or build a data mart back in the days? And be like, yeah, it's a little more involved than, than that. Although it's, it's gotten a lot better. Um, yeah, but, I, I was on my first data warehousing project last century. That's how old I am. Uh, it, it, it was at a major insurance company and I was one of the metadata modelers for the for the back end and you know modeling all the back end systems that were going to be presented in this data warehouse and it was just a hideous project it was i ran ran away from data as fast as i could after that project and never wanted to do it again but it seems uh, like but all of these systems i mean in your role now i mean again it's it's a data management is inside of everything when microsoft restructured when uh, uh, when Satya came on board as CEO and he talked about being more data driven in all the product teams and they started, you saw instantly they were hiring just about every team 
a data, data scientist, a data analyst, I'm having that kind of function, it really highlighted, you know, the, the shift in the way that, you know, software was being developed and being data driven in product development. Yeah. And, and now, because, you know, we've got AI and machine learning at our fingertips. So having the data in a format that you can use is really important. So that, that's been my project for the last two years. So I started, we started in January 2019, um, building an Azure data world for us so that we could access all the amazing stuff in their stack. Um, and we've, we've pretty much got it so that we can access all of the data we need now. And we have automated pipelines to bring data in. So with a really small team, we've, we've managed to be really agile uh, and now we can give people insights because it's all about the insights. The data is irrelevant on its own. It's just inert. Uh, it's only when you bring it to life as meaningful information that it's useful to anyone. So that that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to build as much valuable insight for as many people across the organisation as possible. So we're trying to deal with big slabs of the organisation instead of meeting one person's unique special needs. We're trying to meet as many people's needs as possible. So what are some of the ways that the university is using the data? I mean, I'm I, I have some ideas if I were in the education sector, how I might look at that. But do you have like low, low level down to, you know, professors to, um, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, trending data for their students or is it done at a higher level uh, across a, a college or a focus area? Uh, well, we're doing all of, all of the above. Um, so we've got, it, we've got the, We've got the data at the most granular level, so we can roll it up however we want. So that was a, one of the fundamental things. We bring it into a raw data lake, in, in an Azure raw data lake, and then we apply the business logic and business transformations using Databricks, and then we put it into a, a SQL, an Azure SQL data warehouse and into an Azure curated data lake because we actually realised that the data scientists don't really want raw data. Everyone thinks they want raw data. So I'll give you an example. Yeah. So when you when you apply to study at our college, at our university, um, you, you, you make an application and then we look at it and we go, oh, we'll give you an offer. And some people get an offer and they can get straight in and some people get a conditional offer. So we'll give you an offer, but only if you show us your English scores or we, we'll give you an offer if you finish your current degree this year. So you've got all these conditional offers and they, there's all these different codes for conditional offers and they all roll up into the nice category in our curated data lake of conditional offers. Now, if you look in the raw data lake, you've got to know what those codes mean. So if you're a data scientist who's looking at the raw data, you've got to go, oh, what's this code mean? What's that code? Whereas you actually need it neatly categorised so that you can just go, oh, there's all the conditional offers. So that was a real lesson for us that, that data scientists actually need some level of curation of the data. And that's, that was an important function for my team to, to perform. Well, you know, it's funny. So I've been through a couple of the, uh, so we've got a partner organization here in the Salt Lake area that is uh, a big uh, dynamics consultancy. And they were doing a, um, a Power BI training course. And a lot of people, when they look at it, what you can do with Power BI, even, even some of the cool stuff, the new features with Excel, that tap into some of the AI capabilities and is really kind of a, a you know a front door into uh, you know, moving you over into Power BI, but they see these beautiful visualizations, these dashboards that are built, and they're just like, oh, just you pull the data together and I'll just build these quick dashboards. There are a few steps behind the scenes to make it look that good, you know. And it yeah. but it, it speaks to the same issue. It's it's, it's uh, you need to have somebody that understands the data. There's a lot of massaging or normalization of that data to get it into the right format to feed definitions, that. Definitions, definitions, data right. and information governance is so um, important, it, and it's a hobby course of mine. So, because um, yeah. a big part of my job is is data and information governance, and um, getting the business definitions so that you don't have like a board or a council meeting where two people come up and go, "Oh, here's my report, and it defines." you know, new students as this, and this other person defines it as that, and then they all have a fight about the data, you just, it's not productive. Anyway, we've had a couple of those incidents. That, that was what led to my job being created six years ago. Um, they had a number of incidents like that where they, where they had big fights in 
council meetings instead of actually getting on with business. Um, so we, we, we manage business glossaries and definitions and what we do with our, our reporting is we put all the definitions on the final page so everybody understands that when we're talking about new students, we define it this way and we count it this way so you can get the same numbers. And what we do is all those great capabilities with Power BI and just a, a really fascinating thing, we've not done any formal training in it. We just use the Microsoft Guided Online Learning for, for how to use Power BI. And that's what we tell people to do is like literally do not go and pay for training. Just go do that. You will learn everything you need to know. It's really amazing. Um, but we tell them go and pull your CSVs together and use them to create your Power BI's as prototypes and then bring them to, to us when you're happy with them, bring them to us and we'll automate them for you. So that's the thing that we offer. So we don't, we went from being the Power BI, we, the equivalent of the Power BI report writers, and we've shifted my team to be more the data engineers who build the automated pipelines and people build their own Power BI's. And then we automate them once they're, they're happy with them. And that's what proved to be a really good model. And it's, it's democratised the access to the data and it's us fulfilling a role that's more value adding in the organisation because if you're just the report writers for an organisation, we've got 60, 65,000 students around about, yeah. four or 5,000 staff. We, all we did in, in my small team was disappoint people when we were the report writers because we couldn't keep up with demand. So we had to change the game and that was part of the data strategy that, that I did in late 2018 where we made the decision to jump to Azure from our legacy platform and we decided to shift my team to being data engineers. So that, that's been really successful. Is the rest of the university, are they also on the Microsoft stack? Are they using uh, Microsoft 365? Are they using are they, you know, kind of all yeah. the other tools as well? Yeah. It, we were really lucky. Um, our IT business, our IT business unit has undergone some turmoil. So we've had um, five, five or six leaders in five or six years in our IT function. Um, and in one of the early ones, they had a project to roll out Office 365. It was about four, three, three, four or five years ago. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. And they had this project and they, they closed it down. They defunded the project. So the project team just looked at it, turned all of Office 365 on and walked away. And so the whole uni were looking at it and going, oh, what's this? What's this? Oh, what's this Teams thing? Oh, what's this? Oh, look, we've got this Power BI thing. And we bought an, we bought an A5 license, which is like an E5 license for academics. Yeah. So we've got everything. And, and IT just turned it on and left us with it. Which, <laughs> funny enough, is how a lot of organizations, you know, they, they do exactly that. They just like, you know, it, it, was, it was more complex in the older days where there's, you know, you had additional or, or, you know, all kind of these add-ons or these, you know, these additional server solutions that were added on, they would turn everything on and uh, which creates a, you know, just a governance mess. Um, well, it, it has, but, but the thing is, it's out there now and you can't pull it back. So right. they're sort of stuck with it. And um, other universities in Australia are going, how did you get all of that turned on? I was just like, it was just luck. They just, <laughs> I don't know why they did it. It was, but it was really good. And that was an important part of my thinking for Azure as the data platform, because I was having lunch with a, a girlfriend of mine, Agnes Panosian, who's been at Microsoft forever, as many Microsoft people are. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've got to get off my legacy data platform. And, she, and I don't know. And I've done this AWS proof of concept and the business love it. She's like, we've got an amazing data stack. And I said, well, I didn't, I haven't heard about it. Why don't I know about it? And she, she arranged some workshops for me. And I was like, oh, my God, this is really great. So we, we did our due diligence and we, we decided that that was the way we were going. So it's been really successful. So we're two years into the project and everybody's happy with us. So we, we're quite happy with this. That, that's great. Well, it's, I, I was thinking too um, about uh, how a university might start you know, adopting the technology. I was thinking about how you know, every Monday I've got it now a weekly uh, uh, synopsis, the My Analytics you know, presenting with, providing me with it. Do you do anything like that for, uh, for the, 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 you know, educators where they're, for their, their programs, for their classes, where they're getting kind of a weekly rolling, hey, here's performance, here's other data, here's insights into what's happening with your students? Yeah, yeah, and we're, we're sort of consolidating 
going to planning to consolidate that into my data world. So what, what's happened over the last few years is many people have done different things on different platforms and now new leadership have come in and go, why are they doing that over there and you're doing that? Let's move them into that world. Because my, my value proposition is I will manage the secure bubble, the secure as your bubble, and I'll look after security and I'll look after all of the plumbing bits for you. And you can, we'll build the pipelines to automate your data and then you can build your Power BI's on the front end. Uh, or, and, 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 or other things, like we have a business unit that wants Excel and we used to email them, we used to run an Excel file, a file, extract it from the data warehouse and email it to them every Monday. And we stopped emailing it and my boss was like, where's that file gone? And I was like, it's, it's in the app. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, the Excel file is in the app. It's automatically connected to the data warehouse. It's updated whenever you want it to be. And she's like, oh, my God, that's amazing. And I, we had told her about it. She just hadn't paid attention to it until she was looking for her email for the numbers. So people, we were able to help people with their own ability to, to play with the data, but we can automate the connection. So it my goal is to make all of the downloading of CSVs and munging of CSVs into Excel spreadsheets go away. That's my, my mission in life. Yeah, I'd be interested to know, like, from a, from a, like, you know, inside the university, like, from a community standpoint, um, how are you communicating out kind of the latest, greatest? I mean, how, how are you, are, are people kind of self-driven? They're coming with questions. Do you have kind of a way that you're communicating out? Here's what's going on. And, um, we've got a really normal bell curve of people. There's the people who are not interested at all to the really keen people and a whole bunch in the middle. Um, so we use a multi-layered strategy. So we've got, uh, so I've established a Power BI user group um, and we've got that, we've got newbies because there's a whole lot of people who are just, uh, just discovering things like that. And then we've got a whole lot of power users. So we're, and now we've got a central team where they can have conversations amongst themselves. Uh, which is really great. Um, we have a university email newsletter. We publish stuff in there um, regularly so that people, because we, we, we actually, I don't read it, but everybody else does. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, just write, write it. I push people to it, but I never touch the stuff, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and, but, but, but people do, you know, it's like people do read shopping brochures that get put in your letterbox. Like there are a group of people who read those things. I don't, you know, I'm not one of the, I'm not a newsletter reader. Um, but, but yeah, so we put it in that and then I actually do tours. So, so I have somebody who schedules me through the year to go and visit different faculties and different divisions and go to their meet, monthly meetings and talk about what we're doing and what's coming. Um, we've got a website that, talks about what we're doing in the data space and data governance website. Um, and then I send regular emails out to leadership and ask them to cascade it down. Um, so we have a multi-channel marketing strategy because uh, you've got to keep talking about it until you're sick of it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. If you're, if you're not sick of hearing it, you haven't communicated enough. <laughs> That's the bar. Okay. Yeah. That's the bar. Yeah. Well, there's definitely some topics that I'm sick of talking about. Yeah. 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 You're probably only just starting to cut through. Yeah. That's right. Well, we always just say, you know, it, it's, it's funny doing a lot of uh, community events over the year, the last 12 years, uh, almost 12 years. Um, and uh, you see, of course, you know, new releases, new features come out and, and a lot of the MVPs and RDs are excited to go and present on and start talking about all the new stuff. And then you forget that the people that are showing up to these events that are dialing into these webinars, they want a lot of that 101 content, a lot of that core content. You might be sick of it, but there's still huge audiences as, as more and more new people are coming on and adopting a lot of these technologies and they need kind of that, that baseline of, of content still. And so yeah. they're, you, you have to, I think uh, you constantly, you know, check in to find out, you know, are, are, have people mo really moved on to those advanced topics or how much of this baseline content do we still need to provide? Yeah. And 
only yesterday, one of, one of my colleagues was complaining because I made him go to a cybersecurity course and he said, oh, it was, it was too easy for me. And I said, I said it, it was so, so that you could see the quality of the training for your people. And his people found it really, really interesting, but it was all the really basic stuff like, you know, use a complex password, use a password manager, use your antivirus, make sure that's on, use a firewall. You know, all, all of that 101 stuff. Which he's and I was like, yeah, you're too sophisticated for it. Yeah. It's okay to be too sophisticated for it. Hey, speaking of cybersecurity, I, I'd be interested to know if there are like what are the differences? I'm sure there are some differences with you know being in industry versus within you know education. Because my my thought is that well, it, you know, a CIO for a large corporation um, that maybe has fifty to one hundred thousand employees. But most of those employees, if not all of them, have signed an NDA. They're behind that that firewall. Their their purpose is to, you know, in theory, drive value for the business. When you're talking about 60, 70,000 students and the faculty that support them, those students aren't thinking, hey, is what I'm doing is the handling of this data, this third-party data, is this compliant? Is this secure? Uh, so I, I imagine that you run into a lot of headaches that uh, a lot of organizations don't have to experience to the to the same degree. So what do you, what are some of the differences between security issues? You know, you, you you have hit on you have hit on a real issue for us, and it's it's kind of the different mission. So in an in a corporation, you're trying to set keep your secrets. Uh, you know, you, you trade secrets and not share them with people. Um, in the university, it's all about openness and connectedness. And when I arrived at the university about eight years ago, we had three full class B ranges publicly addressable with no firewalls. And I walked in and I was like, oh, my God. Uh, that changed. Um, we got hacked in 2012 before it was cool. <laughs> and they got in through our domain controllers yeah. and um, we suddenly, and back in those days I was in IT and um, we did the whole thing, you know, set up firewalls properly, got a chief information security officer, all of, all of those sensible things. And we were really lucky that we got hacked so early uh, because it was a huge wake up call to everybody. Um, and now several other universities were hacked. Uh, only recently and they got hacked through their domain controllers too so the same way we got hacked and if they read our stuff they would have known to harden those um, so there was that so that we had zero security function in 2012 mm. when we got hacked um, and now we have quite a solid one uh, so that's that's a big step forward for an institution that just didn't think it needed to be secure and didn't think it needed to harden its perimeters and I think the interesting thing now is, is that organisations have changed. Even for a bank, you, you can't lock everything behind the firewall now. You've got to, you've got to realise that your perimeter is now your people and your, their identity and authentication, um, not your firewalls. So that's kind of changed the game anyway. Um, but our mission is to communicate with other organisations that are doing research, so business and other universities. Um, so we're a very open kind of organisation and that's got its own set of problems. So, and that's where data and information governance come in and, and it works hand in glove with cybersecurity. It's like the CISO and I are joined at the hip mm -hmm. um, because you need to work out what data needs to be protected and how to protect it and what data doesn't so much need to be protected. So we've got, I used to work in the engineering faculty and I was wandering around talking to our researchers and just to find out how much data I was dealing with and what kinds. And when I had to stop counting when we got to exabytes because I couldn't do the math in my head anymore. Uh, so there was a huge amount of data. So we've got, you know, we've got satellites on our roof in one building that just take data feeds of um, for, for disaster mapping. Um, we've got climate science, we've got um, some uh, petroleum engineers in one building who go and take petroleum core samples and run them through a CT scanner and then do a whole lot of um, algorithmic analysis of them. They generate something like 
six terabytes a day for every run that they do. Wow. You know, so there's all of that. And then we've also got a hospital. So we've got clinical trials data. We've got patient data. We've got students who are doctors in training who deal with patients. So, you know, we've got all of the things that you could possibly imagine to secure and many different levels. So we, we take data classification really, really seriously. And, um, and we have a special process for researchers that takes account of their special needs. And we have separate processes for the administration and learning and teaching. Um, but the reason data and information governance is so important for cybersecurity is because cybersecurity is like a big black hole. You can just stand there throwing money in as long as you want. Yep. And you have scarce amounts of cyber dollars and you've got to work out how to spend them. And data and information governance helps you do that. And that's why it's important. And, and when I realised that, because when I got this job, I was like, oh, Google this job. And there was literally nothing uh, because this job was brand new. Like, there was no way I could have been trained for this job because when I left high school, because it didn't exist. Right. And that's why I tell everyone not to worry about the kids. The kids, their jobs don't exist yet. Their jobs will exist in the future. Just give them good education. That, that's how it always ends. These people that say like all the jobs that we're going to lose to AI and cables out there. It's like, it's like, no, it's, it's going to open up so many new opportunities. Things that it's like, well, what, what jobs, what are they going to do? It's like, we don't even know yet. I mean, it's, it's interesting that you see a lot of the forecasting of, you know, future job growth. And I think uh, two or three different lists that I've seen, the number one uh, job is data scientist in every category. I have uh, one of my kids, he's at the University of Utah here. He's in, his major is atmospheric, atmospheric sciences. Uh, at one point he wanted to go work for NASA and kind of in you know, that kind of that side of things. And I said, you know, Nick, you really should look at um, a, a like a data science, like a computer science minor and start looking at some of these courses. And when he looked into it, he said, you know, really the people that move forward in this program and work towards getting their doctorate, it's not until grad school when they really start getting into these into this area. It's it's required as part of the master's and, and PhD programs. I said, Nick, think how far ahead of all of your peers you will be if you go and have a minor where you're focusing specifically on this. I said, and the fact that I think through me, you can get access to all of these free tools, all of the training courses, all this stuff, like go look into it. So he, he added it on. He's one of those smart kids though. He, you know, straight a uh, complaining about all his advanced math classes are too easy, you know, that kind of stuff. But <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, uh, you hate those people. But uh, uh, he, uh, yeah, but he's he's data science is now his his minor, and he's uh, getting excited about this. I I said, you know, you're you're likely going to you do a, a couple years of classes, you're going to go and be able to find part time jobs that again none of your peers are going to be qualified to go and do. You'll be able to go and and start in early on. I, I think it's just a huge and, and it's a, and it's a great thing to have you know to travel the world when when we can all leave home. That is yeah, with COVID, right. but. You know, if you if you've got these sort of skills, you can you can work anywhere, and that's that's really great. You must be really you sound really proud of him. Yeah, I am very very proud. I, I you know four kids, two of them are STEM kids, doing very well on that, and two of them are business ones. And I tell them, I said, you know, they're they're. I said you can find a lot of opportunity too, but you know it, it's uh it, it's uh I mean as you know in in business and in marketing when if you've got that that focus again it's transferable across you know, multiple industries, um, but uh, there, there you have to, um, well, I guess I was going to say that you have to kind of keep up, keep up on the latest trends. I think that's true in just about every profession out there now where you have to. I, I literally just did a talk the other day to the, uh, uh, the Australian um, Data Marketing Association um, about about how data underpins everything that they're doing. And I, I showed them the, the Gartner hype cycle for digital marketing 2019. And I said, everything on that page is underpinned by data. If you don't have your data sorted and you don't know what it is and you're not doing, you don't have data integration and you haven't got metadata management and all of this stuff, you can't do any of those things on that diagram. And you need to get... If data is, is is underpinning everything in digital transformation now, 
And uh, I don't think many people have joined the dots and realised that if they don't get their data under control and secure, they're not going to be ready for the new world. And COVID has driven that, that change exponentially because in January, I had some colleagues in computer science who were telling me, oh, my course is special and unique and it can never go online. <laughs> February, I came back from my vacation in, at the end of February and it was all online. Three weeks later, they yeah. were online. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the reality is there are certain things like uh, my, my son's, a lot of his science classes, you know, they, the labs are like, how are you doing the labs? He's like, yeah, it's, it's less than ideal. We're, we're watching videos and there's, we, there's nothing that we can do to follow along. We just have to watch, you know, double the number of videos and lectures around that. Uh, and so he can't wait to, to get back into, into class. And, and so fall, it's about to, it's going to start here in another couple of weeks. And uh, it's the most of it will be, it'll be hybrid. Most of it be online, but those labs, they've got it broken up to have, you know, just a handful of students that are available in the facilities, but knowing that like they have to physically be there and have access to equipment. Yeah. And, that, and that's been the real problem for us too. So we're bringing people back in, um, in for tutorials and labs only. Um, all the lectures are online. So we're keeping the hybrid model too. Um, and, 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 you know, if you could, if you if you're a civil engineer and you're crushing concrete, you actually need to crush some concrete to get an idea of what happens. Right. So the you know labs are a really important part of education and um, virtually we've got some virtual medical labs though. So we used to have um, you know where they would all get a slide and they'd look at it under a microscope and then they'd all have a slightly different slide and then they'd all not see the same thing. So they've developed some virtual labs where everybody gets to see the same thing. If you're looking through a microscope, you can just as easily look on a screen yeah. to detect things. So, but now we have the challenge that they need to use a microscope before they graduate. So they do have to do it eventually, even though they, they can do a whole lot of labs while they're studying, um, they still do need to learn how to use a microscope because they will have to do it when they, when they graduate. Uh, so that's that's kind of an interesting thing where you've got some stuff that you can digitize and some stuff that just has to be real life. Yeah, well, it's uh, well, I think that's with a lot of the the you know the student experience. It's it's just an unfortunate side of that too. Is that a lot of the uh, I mean, it, look you need to you need to have programs that cater to different learning styles. Um, some people like myself included, I did much better through high school. Uh, where I really excelled is where I was, you know, independent study, go read something, write reports, uh, interact with my professors, uh, my the teachers, and but more of a one-on-one -on -one or small group project type stuff. When I was sitting, I just my my I just couldn't stay awake in a lecture and then go and take a test. That's not my my style. Where some people, I like my wife and a couple of my kids, they like they love the lectures. And they remember all this data for, I don't know how they do it. They remember all this stuff and go in and take these, these massive, these long tests and do very well. And then uh, you'll struggle with the, uh, with the written, with the papers and that, that side of it. Um, you you got to have the different styles. I imagine one of the challenges, especially for your role, is that when you think of like, uh, um, you know, 65,000 students, when that was all predominantly classroom study, probably didn't have the level of impact on the systems that you have now with everybody online, very little happening in person. Um, has that- well, We were so lucky we went Office 365 for everybody, the students and staff. So we were already there. So when everybody went home, all we needed to do was increase our capacity a bit and we were fine. We, I was talking to the Azure team and they were saying, there were universities coming and saying, we need to get online to Office 365 this week, please. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't yeah. want to be, you know, everyone's suddenly gone home. No one knows how to use it. And we'd already been through that years ago. So we, we were really lucky. Um, and we're, we're using um, Teams a fair bit. We were already using Teams a fair bit for teaching. And one of our um, senior lecturers in engineering, David, Ke Dr. David Kellerman, who, who I work with really closely, uh, has been doing some really pioneering stuff about teaching using Teams, mm -hmm. and he's used. It, he's actually thrown away his textbook. He teaches um, 
first year students mainly. So first year sort of solid mechanics sort of courses. So he's in mechanical and manufacturing engineering. And he's literally thrown away the textbook because he realised that um, a textbook was an equity issue. Text engineering textbooks are quite expensive, so not everyone buys them. And he's actually, they build the course as they go through the term. Hmm. And um, he uses Teams, and he was already using Teams before COVID, so his teaching hasn't been impacted at all. Um, so he would have students, you know, he would have, things like autistic students who found the classroom too distracting, who would sit outside the classroom but participate through teams. And, you know, so they, they were able to just go home and be fine with it. Um, and my colleagues who were saying, oh, my course is special and unique and can never go online, they were behind the eight ball because they're, they're not used to using this technology, so they had to learn it on the fly and it wasn't ideal for anybody. So I think... I think COVID has really driven exponential, COVID is an exponential problem, you know, we see all the charts, but it's also driven digital transformation exponentially across many organisations. And I, I said at my talk yesterday, um, if your organisation isn't digital now, it will die. Yeah. Well, that, and there's, I, I think a couple of things that you said there, there, I've heard uh, uh, you know, that a number of businesses that have had a similar experience where they were already using Office 365, they were already starting to use Teams, so the shift was relatively easy. Of course, there's always some things that you have to figure out to do. We're just we're, you know, it, it's not just a collection of of data and coordination of of content. You know, this is now the way that we're working. But some businesses have come out and said that you know. Uh, who, who previously said maybe even didn't have uh, uh, you know cross the board work from home policies in place, who said you know what we're going to stay this way that we find that people are happier that they could be more productive. Uh, the data shows that people work longer hours because like in my basement office I, I don't know when the sun has gone down you know. <laughs> Sometimes I have to be prompted at like three or four in the afternoon. My wife said, have you eaten lunch yet? Oh, I should do that. I look at it as a win when I've taken a shower but before 1 p.m. You know? I know. I've had, to, I've had to develop some boundaries because it is too easy to lose all your boundaries. So now I wake up and I go upstairs, I have a shower, I put my work clothes on and come back downstairs. And then when I finish, I take, go upstairs and do the opposite thing. Yeah. Um, because I needed some boundaries uh, between work and non-work. Otherwise, yeah, it gets pretty blurry. Uh, but but I, I track, because my team work using Azure DevOps and I can see their productivity and their productivity has gone up. And I suspect it's because they're not all going out for coffee. Yep. And stuff. So we've actually had to institute virtual coffees because you can't always be working and doing the transactional stuff. You've still got to have the social environment because Mental. that's what builds right. the relationships right so we've had to build that in sort of more formally uh because they used to they'd have their stand up in the morning and then they'd all go out and get coffee and that was an important bonding thing and so i think that's we need to find new ways of working that build that sort of thing in but i can tell you my team's productivity has gone up since covid well, it's it's a uh, I, I've been working remotely um, for some companies that I worked for. We got so I left Microsoft in uh, 2009, and 10 months later, the little company in Seattle that I worked for got acquired by the company in Boston. So I was on the road a lot, but uh, you know, working from home for the last decade, uh, mm -hmm. and so it was an easy enough adjustment. That the hard part for me is that you know where I would break up my day or my week. I'm a movie guy, and so I'd love to take a break, you know, midweek and go in the middle of the day, go catch a movie, and that's been all shut down. It's like they're slowly opening that, that stuff back up, um, or go meet with somebody and have lunch. So a lot of my mental breaks, it's kind of like those, those coffee, going out and getting coffee in the month, like that just stopped, and that's where I've recognized, even somebody who's working from home permanently, you know, I recognize that different and it's been, that difference has been difficult to get, get past that. Well, it's winter, it's winter here in Australia. And uh, last month I decided to go down to the snow and, um, 
and I went cross country skiing. And then uh, the next the next day they discovered COVID down there, so I had to self isolate for fourteen days. And I was like, I'm not going. I'm not leaving the house again. <laughs> Where, so where, where do you go? So where's skiing for, for you? So I've, I've been to a number of, uh, of regions down there, but. Um, uh, yeah. So it's south near Canberra in um, the snowy mountains. So I went to Perisher Valley. Okay. It's not a lot of snow. It's not Utah kind of snow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> but, uh, normally, yeah. I, normally this time of year, I'm going to New Zealand, which has great snow. Yes, it does. And yeah, but we can't get out of the country at the moment. Yeah, that's that's uh, sorry. This hey, there's beautiful spaces. You're you're in a, a beautiful area. So I, I I'm sad that I so I I generally am down in Australia and New Zealand uh, at, at least every other year, if not on an annual basis, at least one trip to both countries. And well, so when you come back next time, please, please let, look me up and I'll take you somewhere nice for lunch. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't wait to get back there. It's, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, did I hear this correctly that they're, I, I thought I heard somebody say that they're trying to remove all the bats from that park in Sydney. Is that, what's the, the botanical gardens down there with all the bats in the trees? They, they routinely try to do that. The bats they, come back. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. What are you going to do? Um, Anyway. And, and that's an important pollination source. Like, we want bats. We need bats. Yeah, most people don't know that. If you've not been down to Sydney, um, yeah, if you go down by the Opera House and the Botanical Gardens, I think, whatever the, the you know, the, the park that's adjacent to there, and uh, you can't miss them in the middle of the day. They they are everywhere in, in the trees, yeah. but it's, yeah. a, it, it's a sight. But uh, yeah, yeah, you see things flying in the evening. It's not a bird. It's a bat. Yeah. <laughs> It's a beautiful area. Well, Kate, it's really great uh, meeting you and catching up and learning about uh, some of what you're doing. And uh, you know, so folks that want to get in touch with you, learn more about you, what are the best ways that they can reach out to you? Uh, I'm at K Carruthers on Twitter, K-C-A-R-R-U-T-H-E-R-S and uh, katecarruthers.com. Excellent. We'll provide the links, of course, and everybody can get to find out more information about Kate. And, and hopefully one of these days, when we start having in-person uh, MVP and RD summits again, I'll see you uh, on, on campus you. in Redmond. I miss travel. I, I, I was supposed to be in Chicago last month. Yeah. I was supposed to be in New Zealand this month. <laughs> yeah, I had, uh, I, was, I, had, uh, I had five European trips canceled this year. Mm. Really, really sad about that. And uh, yeah. But, you know, it, it, they are first world problems. So, you know, I, th I just hope that you can stay safe and well. And I look forward to meeting you in real life in the not too distant future. Me too. Well, thanks a lot for your time today. Thank you.